All right, hey everyone. Uh, welcome to conference today. Um, we are again coming from the VA. We switched up our Zoom schedule this week, so I'm taking uh, Amelia's place on Monday. Um, so the conference today, the air up there, we have three cases. We're gonna go through these number was one, then two, then three. Uh, there is clearly a central theme to all these cases, which I think will become pretty apparent uh, once we start going. So if you're not at the VA, feel free to participate via the chat or just speak up. Uh, if you are at the VA, um, the residents in the room are gonna be participating as we go. So let's start with case number one. So you've got a, a gentleman, I'll say he's 31, I forgot to say that here, states he had a Crohn's flare three days ago with nausea, vomiting. He's been soaking in the shower all day to feel better. Tonight had painful breathing on both sides. He's afebrile, heart rate's 108, blood pressure is 131 over 98, 22 breaths per minute, 98% on ambient air. What does that chief complaint uh, make you all think of? Mm-hmm. Great, PE, what else? I like it. So Luke is like saying, is could this be cannabis hyperemesis? Is this a callback to a conference I did a couple of weeks ago? Uh, Luke, I like it. So this conference is going to hammer home some of the stuff we've already talked about. But this is a gentleman who has uh, Crohn's disease, chronic marijuana use complicated by cannabis hyperemesis, coming in with dyspnea and bilateral chest pain after vomiting. So he said three days ago, he had severe nausea vomiting. He was in the shower all day throwing up. While in the middle of throwing up, he noticed new central chest pain shortly after he felt short of breath. Pain is worse when he drinks water and swallows and says shortness of breath is worse with deep breaths. All right, so what about that HPI jumps out to you guys and what does that make you think? Perf or tear. Nice, so these days residents say Borhav and then here our residents are saying perf or tear. And what about this is sort of consistent with a perf or tear? Great. So pain that's worse after vomiting, it's worse with uh, worse when drinking water and swallowing, and it came on after vomiting. Excellent. All right. So um, this is not going to be a huge diagnostic dilemma early on. All right. So let's get some imaging. The, e- the ED gets a chest x-ray. And I'll give you guys about 30 seconds to, that is not the right chest x-ray. I'll give you guys about 30 seconds to, uh, actually, I'll give, you a, I'll give you a physical exam first, just to just to play the game. All right, so what is abnormal on this physical exam? Great. Great, he's got crepitus and he has some guarding. Perfect, not gonna dwell on this a whole bunch. All right, so a chest X-ray is obtained and it is right here. So take about 30 seconds and I want you guys to tell me, uh, we'll have an intern read this and give me their uh, focused read of this chest X-ray. All right, uh, brave intern, want to give me their focused read of this chest x-ray. Love it, Dom. What do you got? Um, things that are sticking out here. Yeah, heart's normal. Lung field growth should be normal. But if you look above the right clavicle, you can see like it looks like air infiltration underneath the septum there. Awesome. And why? Like, what about that looks like air? Like, how would you describe that pattern? Like this black patchy. I don't have any black details. Uh, it just looks like air to me. Great. It looks like air, like separating the fascial planes, yeah. which is perfect. So Dom is exactly correct. This gentleman uh, had subcutaneous air on both exam and sort of around his clavicle and around his neck. So that's not great. Um, What sort of workup do we do for people that have subcutaneous emphysema? So take about 30 seconds at your table. And I want you guys to give me uh, next studies you wanna order to further work up subcutaneous emphysema.
All right, uh, UCH threw in chess CT, upper GI series. Uh, Lila, what were you guys thinking? Was that a swallow study for gastro problems to see if it extrapolates? Great. And so Lila was saying she wants a swallow study with gastrograffin, which she chose because that is less toxic to the lungs than some of our other contrasts. So uh, that's exactly correct. So we need chest imaging and we need some sort of imaging of the esophagus. So the first thing we're going to have is chest imaging. So here is this person's uh, CT chest. I'm going to play this through. Uh, already, you guys should probably see there is an abnormality there. Uh, we'll play this through twice. All right, and we'll run this back here. So where does this person have air? Everywhere, great, all right. All right, so he's got air in the mediastinum. Where else? Axillary, so Dom's getting out. He's got like the sub-Q tissue. He's got it in the neck. Does he have a pneumothorax? No. I also don't think he has anything under his Awesome. And it like tracks down as a, is Great. So he has, yeah, he's got air like throughout his mediastinum. So what Dr. Heppy's getting at is if you look around his uh, aorta here in the mediastinal space, you can see air there as well. But notably, he has absolutely no pneumothorax on this scan. All right. So that's what sub-Q air looks like. And so this conference, by the end of this conference, if you guys can't recognize what sub-Q air looks like, then I have failed. Um, so just a heads up for future imaging studies. Okay. So that is the CT chest. And then Leela and Co. and UCH asked for a swallow eval as well. First, I'll just I'll show you what the CT showed first, just to, just to hammer home that point. So they showed extensive pneumomediastinum with gas extending throughout the retropharyngeal, parapharyngeal, and paraspinal soft tissues. Um, the airways were thickened, extensive mediastinal gas, and they said rupture of either a uh, airway or distal esophagus could be responsible for both of these findings. So uh, CT surgery was consulted and said, please get the uh, esophagram. So esophagram was obtained. Uh, and if you guys have ever wondered what it looks like watching someone drink through a straw while under fluoro, I have good news. Today, today's the day. All right, so we're not supposed to be esophagram experts, um, but I just want someone to call out, we'll play this twice, if you see contrast leaving the esophagus. Yeah. Play that one more time. Mm -hmm. All right. So bets. So let's say, uh, raise the hands here. Who thinks this is a normal esophagram? Who thinks this is an abnormal esophagram? So normal esophagram. Raise your hands. Sure. All right. Got some people. Abnormal esophagram. A similar number. A lot of people abstaining at the VA today. Um, so this is a normal esophagram. So this does not show an esophageal leak. Um, spoiler, you will see an abnormal one in just a little bit, but this is a normal esophagram. And so this gentleman uh, was diagnosed with a question of possibly Borhaupt syndrome or a micro perforation of his esophagus causing a pneumomediastinum from vomiting. So for the room, uh, what is Borhaupt syndrome? We throw that word around a lot in med school and after, but what does the actual syndrome mean? Someone say that louder. Transmural tear. Great, transmural tear, perfect. So you have an esophageal tear, uh, and specifically you need to have an esophageal tear uh, with effort. So it has to come in the setting of vomiting or uh, coughing or something. So uh, believe it or not, Borhab was a Dutch chemist, physician, like do it all. Uh, and he actually described it in 1724 in this article, uh, which was thankfully translated uh, by some people from Tulane a little while ago. 
and it's actually kind of insane. This is this is like one of the or this is an insane like 24 pages. But just to drive home what Borhav is, let's really briefly go through his initial description of it. So Borhav, uh, he writes this basically like a book. Um, and here's how he first said. He said, "This is why he's describing why he's actually talking about this." But he describes it as an atrocious malady. Uh, whose vehement vehicle hastened the death of the great hero, that famous nobleman, Baron John von Wessenauer, uh, who apparently was a famous gentleman. Um, and he said, the nature of the disease was so extraordinary, the attack so violent and suffering so abominable, you would scarcely find among all the writers any similar case. So no one had ever described this previously. Mm -hmm. So then he goes in in this 24 pages, like real old school, describing how exactly he came about this diagnosis. And he says that this Baron, uh, after having a very gluttonous feast, was sitting on a chair trying to vomit to make himself feel better. And after numerous times of vomiting, he suddenly gave forth a horrifying cry in which his uh, servants came into the room. And he told them that the upper part of his stomach was ruptured, torn, or dislocated. And then his servants asked him how he was doing. And he said, I feel like my life is going to last for just a few more moments. So he, uh, he called his shot, and he was uh, correct. So it gets worse though. So then this gentleman dies and after he dies, uh, Borhab uh, is like, I need to open him up and figure out what's going on. And so he basically does a completely normal and uh, anatomical exam until he gets to the thoracic cavity. He opens him up and he finds that he has a smell like of duck flesh emanating from inside of his thorax. And then he asks people around some great detective work and he finds out that duck flesh uh, was the last meal with the noble baron. So they've now found the last thing he ate inside of his thorax. They keep going, and ultimately, the very last thing he finds and comments on is that he has a rupture in his esophagus, um, which is causing black fluid to leak into the cavity. So this is the first ever description of Borhoff syndrome. It's horrible. And um, it was basically uniformly fatal for a very long time because there was nothing we could do about it. But how do we manage it now? So take about 30 seconds, and let me know what you guys come up with. All right. Uh, what did you guys think of? How do we treat uh, Borhoff syndrome? So UCH residents say strict NPO, if not better, thoracic surgery, which is great. So number one is you're, you want to make them NPO while you're working this up. Uh, number two is you want to consult surgery. And what surgery will tell you is if, if they are stable, then you can wait right? Because uh, intrathoracic surgery is pretty highly morbid uh, and complicated. And so if they are stable, your last resort should be surgery. And then what's the last thing we want to give these people? Antibiotics. Yes, antibiotics, right? So anytime something ruptures in your body, you should probably give those people antibiotics. And so what are you going to cover with your antibiotics here? Gram Great, gram negatives. Anaerobes. And then call back to the fungal talk we did last week. What else should we cover here? Yeah, Canada. So you want to cover fungal stuff that can live in your esophagus. Big one there is Canada. So these people are generally recommended to get Zosin right off the bat, and then some sort of antifungal coverage, which in this case was fluconazole. Um, and then when you discharge these people, you want to put them on a prophylactic regimen for at least a certain amount of time if they're not getting surgery. And so you narrow to moxifloxacin, and you keep the fluconazole. And typically you treat them for anywhere from like 10 to 14 days, assuming everything else is stable, they're tolerating PO, and your esophagram is negative or not getting worse. Any questions about Borhoff syndrome? Do you ever like do like a EBD, like EBD, and like a stent over the, over the 
Nice. So Evan asked, do you ever do an EGD? And in this particular case, GI said no EGD because the risk of uh, reopening a perforation and not letting it heal naturally is pretty high, depending, um, depending on how large it is. And so GI said no in this case, um, but our next case, you'll see the alternative. But yeah, so no in most cases, and let them heal. Any additional questions about Boerhaave syndrome? All right, so squad goal, find a disease, describe it in a rich person, and then just cross your fingers that in three centuries, people are still talking about it. All right, so case number two, uh, the theme to this case, conference right, is air up there. So air, it's not, in places it's not supposed to be. All right, so case two, you get shortness of breath and cough despite a treatment course of levofloxacin for pneumonia. Uh, increased work of breathing on walking, relieve with rest and inhalers, NEBS at home, COVID's negative times two on just a little bit of oxygen, but otherwise afebrile. So, what are the oh yeah, great, sorry. This is a 45-year-old uh, woman who is, sorry, 51, who is otherwise healthy. 51-year-old woman, no past history, 20-pack year smoker, dyspnea and cough, one month ago had pleuritic chest pain, white sputum, got some inhalers, got some antibiotics, didn't feel better, came back to the ED one week later with ongoing symptoms. Uh, does this sound different than our last case, similar? Different, different. great. And so um, how would you change your differential based on this sort of uh, question stem? Great. Great, so questionably palm this time, uh, seems less likely to be a primary GI malady. I like that. All right. Great, so brings up vocal cord dysfunction or VCD. I like that. So sort of like a mimicker of uh, obstructive lung disease or asthma. And we're throwing in the heart as well. I like that. Lila, why did you think maybe pericarditis? Well, just the time for a pleuric chest pain. Could have some like this hand, yeah, she's splinting. The cough of white sputum doesn't like fit as well, but she could have like a URI that just didn't really resolve and caused it. Cool. That's all great. Wonderful ideas. All right. So here is her initial chest x ray. And then UCHPE, awesome. One of our can't miss diagnoses. So take about 30 seconds. This is the, uh, this is like the, the extra special resolution image. So things are going to look a little bit brighter. Um, but take about 30 seconds and then give me your read for this chest x-ray. All right, who wants to be brave? Dom read the last one. Anyone want to take a shot at this x-ray? Just uh, any abnormalities you see? I don't need the full read necessarily, if there are any abnormalities. All right, we got a deafening silence in the room, which is appropriate. Great, so Dom again says there is widening of the mediastinum. That is a wonderful pickup. That was not picked up by three teams initially who had this, but a widened mediastinum. And specifically the only abnormality here, which they saw on hindsight was that they thought that there was some right sort of upper hilar fullness. But again, then again, no one saw this the first time around. They said this was normal. Uh, and because um, she was sort of otherwise NOS, they got a CT scan. Before they got that, they got some labs. White counts 25, 86% PMNs. Does that change uh, how you're thinking about this case? Yes. yes. And then this seems obvious, but how so? You may think of like infection process or context of our infection process. Yeah. 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 Cool, so infection, air, and perf. Awesome, love it, CJ. Okay, let's get to that CT scan. 
And again, I want you guys to give me your, uh, we'll run this through a couple times, but tell me where the abnormality is. That's kind of quick. We're going to play that one more time. The question I'll pose to you guys is, is she the first person on earth with two tracheas? All right, last time here, and I'll go slow it down at the key spot. So what are we looking at right here? Specifically, what is that thing? Is that the trachea? Where is your esophagus in relation to your actual? So that's the esophagus. So if that's the esophagus right there, and we follow this down, then what is that? Great, that is air. Perfect. So that is really super abnormal. So that is uh, confusing because it's sort of almost looks physiologic, but that is air. And so this person has air within their mediastinum. And then if you keep following this down, you can see that there is, they check some Hounsfield units uh, over in this area, which should be a giveaway. But there was a lot of concern for a necrotic mediastinal collection or abscess within the mediastinum. So the final CT read here initially is a large heterogeneous gas containing mediastinal collection contiguous or right perihilar consolidation. So mediastinitis with phlegmon uh, from infection with gas forming organism versus phlegmon with associated airway or esophageal rupture, neoplasm is not excluded. So again, we contact uh, CT surgery because this is the thorax. CT surgery says, please get an esophagram. And I apologize, I don't have moving, I don't have moving pictures for this. Um, so you're just gonna see some still frames here. So the esophagram is abnormal. And so I just put the read down there because none of us are esophagram experts. And this is a different type of esophagram, which is why the colors are different. But there is mid-thoracic uh, mid extravasation. So this area right here on both scans is contrast that's leaking out of the mid-thoracic esophagus into the mediastinum and staying where it is. So uh, what antibiotics do you want to give this woman in addition to her NPO status and surgery consult? Someone say it. We just talked about it. Zosin. Yes, people have spoken. So Zosin, fluconazole, and then she gets narrowed to ceftriaxone, flagyl, and fluconazole as well. So surgery recommends a repeat esophagram. A repeat esophagram is normal, showing us that the leak has closed with antibiotics and being NPO. So they say conservative management, and they discharge this woman on moxifloxacin and fluconazole with plans to repeat a CT scan in one month. Any questions about that brief part of this case? Raise your hand, who thinks that plan worked? Probably not, it did not. So uh, the reason we uh, suggest things is we hope they work, but they don't always work. Um, so five days later, she comes back to the ED generally feeling bad with a worsened cough and increased heart rate. Strangely, her uh, repeat labs or actually her repeat white count is normal. Hemoglobin's normal, platelets are normal. So they repeat a CT scan to figure out what on earth is going wrong with this lady and why is she still coming back? I'm gonna set a record with number of images played in conference today. It's the meta, the meta approach to this. So does this look better, worse, or the same? And is there anything new on here that wasn't there last time? Okay, less air, great. That looks smaller. Looks smaller, okay. Did you guys notice any abnormalities with the vasculature? So something around the vasculature. And then show of hands, if uh, whose pulmonary artery has something uh, jutting out from it? 
or is it just this lady? So specifically, what is the, what is that? That is it. So that is a pseudo aneurysm. So you guys were all correct. Uh, this in some ways looked better, but she also had a new right main PA pseudo aneurysm in the area of her prior infection. So not great. Um, so that official read. So slight interval increase in the size of the mediastinal phlegmon. So you guys did find it again, but it was larger and a new small pseudo aneurysm originating from the posterior wall of the right central pulmonary artery secondary to erosion of the mediastinal collection. So really, really bad. You never want a pseudo aneurysm and you never want a mediastinal collection. And then in this case, to Evan's point earlier, GI says, we will now take her for a scope. And on the scope, they find extrinsic compression in the area of the pseudoaneurysm. So that's uh, the right one is showing the esophagus sort of obliterated by an extrinsic force. And then they do an EBUS as well, or sorry, an EUS as well. And they see uh, this mediastinal fluid collection on the US. So um, all of, if you zoom in here, all of like that junk there is stuff that should not be present. So this is your esophageal lumen there. That's where the probe is. And then all of this is like an ill-defined fluid collection, which should not be present. So again, really, really bad. Definitely don't want that. And then finally, just, just to hammer home what this uh, ultimately showed, extrinsic compression and a mass 4.6 by 2.7 centimeters in the mediastinum abutting the pulmonary artery appears more liquid and inflammatory than neoplastic. Uh, great question. No, she was not. By this point, she was not. She was when she left the hospital last time, uh, but she was not when she came back to the hospital. Why did she have to write? She wasn't vomiting, right? She was not vomiting. No, she was coughing a bunch, but she was not vomiting. Okay. Um, yeah, so right, you don't necessarily need to have a story of vomiting to rupture your esophagus. So the thought that the esophagus ruptured first and then the mediastinal collection happened got infected, the infection swirl got better, so then afterwards you have the pseudo and stuff like that. Is that like the timeline of what we think happened? Yes, that's perfect. Okay. So Cole just summarized it nicely. Uh, he said that the esophagus ruptured for whatever reason, fluid collection formed, fluid collection got a little bit better maybe, put on antibiotics and the pseudo aneurysm forms after, which is exactly the time course we were working with. So CT surgery at this point said, please just let's watch for a couple days and hope this gets better. Uh, and we got a repeat CT scan 48 hours later. And I want you guys then just to do a really focused read on this one and tell me if the pseudo aneurysm is better or worse. Not great. So for those that, that uh, weren't looking or didn't catch it, uh, this right here is the pseudoaneurysm and it is much, much worse. So her pseudoaneurysm worsened in 48 hours and a CT surgeon called, uh, called me at 11 p.m. and said, do you mind if we take her for a pseudoaneurysm repair this evening? And I said, why are you calling me? Please just do it. <laughs> so this woman goes in uh, to take, get take, gets taken emergently to the OR overnight. And why is she taken emergently to the OR? Great. So risk of rupture. So you can't live with a ruptured PA. And so uh, to avoid active exsanguination, she gets taken to the OR. And so she gets a pulmonary artery pseudoaneurysm and the question if she had a mediastinal tumor. She gets a median sternotomy and patch repair and open biopsy. And they end up finding a 1.5 centimeter perforation in the posterior wall of her pseudoaneurysm. Um, so they, they patch this in the OR and she actually does really well and is discharged from the CT surgery service 10 days later on a long OPAC course. And then the question sort of persisted, was this cancer? And so ultimately her path came back and it was all inflammation. So we never grew anything on culture, uh, never saw inflammation, but she did have chronic inflammation, presumably from her mediastinitis, like Cole had just sort of tied together. All right, so that's air in the mediastinum. Okay. Sorry, I missed this maybe, but um, how common is that infection? Correctly diagnosed initially, she had mediastinitis and airtime. 
Okay. Yeah, so um, I think you might have stepped out when Cole nicely summarized it, but we're saying mediastinitis the entire time. So mediastinitis mimicking uh, pneumonia, atypical pneumonia, which right uh, to CJ and Dom's point initially, like we couldn't really see much on the chest X-ray besides a right hilum that like looked a little weird. And so if you're only looking at uh, this chest X-ray over and over again and not getting a CT, you're probably not gonna notice it. So yeah, mediastinitis mimicking asthma, taking a, quite a while to present. Um, they did not. So she ended up on a beta blocker because she had post-op AFib, but they did not ask for a beta blocker just for the pseudoaneurysm. It was more just watchful waiting and uh, fingers crossed. And then Sneha asked, um, they keep calling this a pseudoaneurysm, but is that the same thing as a mycotic aneurysm, which is usually in the PA secondary to infection? Um, good question, Sneha. It sounds like the pseudoaneurysm versus aneurysm question is sort of uh, like an OR diagnosis based on like what they see. Um, and it, my, it was my understanding that if you have a very focal spot like that, which is sort of bulging out, it's a pseudoaneurysm versus if it's a, more of a congenital and sort of vest vascular weakness issue. But yeah, I also could not get a, a great answer as to why this was a pseudoaneurysm versus just a plain old aneurysm. All right, any additional questions about this case? It's kind of concerning how it's not dramatic the initial presentation of esophageal perforation was. Yeah, great point. So Cole brings up that it's sort of concerning how atypical and how well she was on appearance. So I think it's a great point to bring up here that if you if we are treating someone for pneumonia over and over again and they are not getting better, think about things that could mimic pneumonia. And so I think um, the, the admitting hospitals team did a great job here where they actually decided, hey, let's take a step back and not do the same thing for the fourth time and expect a different outcome. So add mediastinitis to your differential for pneumonia mimickers. Ben, any additional, I think you had an additional thought there. I just thought uh, real aneurysms take all layers of the, the vascular wall to see where aneurysms are like missing very quickly. I like that. It's presumably if they have rubbing away, they're going to get swapped off by inflammatory tissue rather than true vascular tissue that they see the aneurysm. I like it. So Min, I think, just hit the nail on the head. He said he thinks it's a pseudoaneurysm because it was uh, being contained by, by inflammatory tissue, hence in the OR, they found the 1.5 centimeter tear, whereas a aneurysm would have still had vascular tissue covering it, um, which is as good as a description as I've heard yet. So we're going with that one. All right, case three. So now, so far, right, we've had air in the mediastinum and sub-Q. We've had air in the mediastinum again from an abscess. In case three, uh, we are going to take the extreme example of all of that. So 60-year-old woman with T-cell lymphoma, COPD, hypereosinophilia, coming in with oral edema and a muffled voice worsening for the last hour, unable to visualize her throat due to tongue edema. Her symptoms worsen over the next 15 minutes, and this decision is made to intubate. This case, uh, we're not going to talk too much about any of her HBI problems. Those are all in the past or stable. Uh, this is going to be uh, an a case of iatrogenic injury. So here's her initial post-intubation x-ray. Um, not to belabor this, the radiologist did us a solid and put some arrows there. Um, so the arrows show a very small uh, pneumothorax on the right side. And does anyone, uh, just to really be clear about this, why do you think she got a, what's the mechanism of uh, pneumothorax here post-intubation? Likely mechanism. air trapping? Yep. Oh, barotrauma, great, yeah. So Min says barotrauma. So that would be one, so where her pressure is too high, or the other one you wanna think about is volutrauma. Is the volume too high? Those sort of go hand in hand, pressure and volume. Um, and on sort of a review of this case in the, at the end of it, they found out that she was accidentally put on nine cc's per kilogram uh, post intubation. So just keep in mind that like the time after intubation matters um, and you should always have people ideally right on that four to six uh, cc's per kilogram uh, no matter what. All right, so this lady has a pneumothorax on positive pressure. What do you anticipate her follow-up x-ray is going to look like? She does not get a, she does not get a chest tube, CJ. That is a uh, astute thought. Why would you put a chest tube in before getting a repeat? Who thinks she's going to get worse if you don't put a chest tube in? 
Dom, why is she going to get worse if you don't put a chest so tube in? Pot, the pressure, you're just basically going to slam that one shot and then basically strangle her, cut off all her blood supply to her and make her breast work. Great. So Dom says that if you don't put a chest tube in at this point with a pneumothorax on the ventilator, you're probably going to have a pneumothorax get worse. And let's see if Dom is correct. Two hours later, uh, yeah, that is her repeat no, chest x-ray. So yeah, so two hours later, um, what are we looking at here? Very bad. Very bad. And is she under tension right now? Great. So Don is saying everything is shifted a little bit. So the endotracheal tube is a little bit more to the to the right side. The hyla is a little bit more to the right. The heart is sort of midline. I'd buy it's a little bit more to the right. Uh, but that is a very large tension pneumothorax. So surgery places a surgical chest tube on the left and Dean abresses her. Hemodynamics get better. And the case continues. All right, so this is my slide here to try to break the record for number of x-rays on one image at one time. But this is a series of unfortunate events happens for this poor woman. And so if anyone ever wondered how many different chest tubes one person can get in a hospital stay or what the different types of chest tubes are that we use at our various sites, here you go. So this is the first chest tube. This is the first chest tube. Is this a surgical chest tube or a pigtail? Surgical, and why is this a surgical chest tube? Great. So that stripe right there, there's a break there, which is called a sentinel hole. So that hole should be inside the chest. Uh, that hole is not inside the chest, but that, sh that hole should be inside the chest. Um, so this is a surgical chest tube. And what else do you notice on this image? Air outside. Great. Um, air outside. So Kate, how did you know that's air outside? Uh, it's dark and it's outside her chest wall. Great. So she has sub-Q air outside of her chest wall. So right off the bat, we know she has sub-Q air outside of her chest wall. So that's her first chest tube. That chest tube gets taken out and a, uh, a pigtail gets put in to write pigtail. This is, a, this is not the classic pigtail, but this one curls, right? Does she still have that sub-Q air? She does indeed still have the sub-Q air. That chest tube gets taken out and another chest tube gets put in. Is the sub-Q air better or worse? Way worse, great. So as Don pointed out, um, it sort of appears like she has an additional lung <laughs> hiding outside of her chest. All right. An additional chest tube is placed and unfortunately due to a series of errors uh, is dislodged. So that chest tube is now in her sub-Q tissue completely. Um, is the sub-Q air better or worse? Worse. So at this point, there was no way to tell whether or not she had a pneumothorax because she has air everywhere in her body. A new chest tube is placed through the same spot. This one is in the chest at least. Uh, and this is the sort of sentinel hole we're talking about. So this break right here, when you're looking at chest tubes, that break should be inside the thoracic cavity because um, that's one of the ports that air can be suctioned out of. Another chest tube is placed. That one's taken out and a pigtail is placed. So at this point, pretty bad. And then her final x-ray is right here. So a new chest tube is placed. This one is going to the apex. That's a true pigtail. So at this point, she's had seven chest tubes placed in 17 days. She's had a couple CT scans. Why does she still have subcutaneous air? Like, how would you guys, how do you reason through this case? Why is she not getting better? Uh, she is not on the vent at this point. So she's been off the vent for, off the vent for about 10 days. Great, CJ, what is a bronchopleural fistula? <laughs> yeah, so CJ says, because she have a bronchopleural fistula? So like, does she have a hole like all the way out here at the lung, which is communicating with the pleura? Great. You said she had how many chest tubes? She had seven chest tubes. Almost every single one of those sites closed properly? Cause... Tell me more about that. I mean, you're reintroducing holes into the chest cavity so I'm kind of curious whether or not when they pulled it out, do they actually sew that correctly and actually make sure it's kind of sealed so no air is getting in and out. Great. So are the holes closing after the tube is being removed versus does she have a bronchopleural fistula? Uh, excellent. So those are the two things we were thinking at this point. Um, CJ, if she did have a bronchopleural fistula, what would you expect her chest tube air leak to look like? 
Persistent. And like what phase of the respiratory cycle would you expect? I like it. So CJ said with expiration, uh, which is close. So this is, you, you never know when you need an image of a chest tube, just save. So when you're looking for air leaks, you look down in this water column over here and there'll be numbers like one, two, three, four. And then you look for bubbles in this column. And so ever how far out the bubbles go help you quantify what type of an air leak it is and how bad it is. So if three is worse than two, four is worse than three. And then you look at the actual phase of the respiratory cycle. So if you have typically a continuous air leak, that is a true bronchopleural fistula, because no matter what phase of the respiratory cycle you are, air is coming out. If you have an expiratory air leak only, that's a, either an alveolar pleural fistula or some other communication. And so in this case, this woman had an expiratory air leak, so we thought a bronchopleural fistula was a little bit less likely, but still possible. All right, so going back over here, these are the two things we're worried about. We finally get a CT chest, which gives us a diagnosis. So that's a lot of air, right? You shouldn't generally, like a human shouldn't look like a tiger or some sort of like <laughs> other animal. Um, we're gonna play this a couple times here. But the diagnosis is somewhere on this screen. All right, so Dom has diagnosed it correctly, but we'll play it again here before Dom tells us what he sees. So you see the chest tube coming in, that's the top one. So where does she have air? All right, so what, why does this woman still have subcutaneous emphysema? Did anyone see on here where it was or why? Don, what did you see? Like on the, the left aspect, you can see like breaks in between each of the ribs. It's a tiny little space, so it's like right there. Wow, great pickup. So Dom has correctly identified that there is a hole between that woman's ribs and where her tubes used to be. And so if you zoom in on that specific area, this woman had a pleurocutaneous fistula. And so this is what it looks like on all three images. So you can see that there is an open space between her ribs. That's the front image, the open space, and that's the lateral image. You can see the hole that's there. So she's a pleurocutaneous fistula from all of these tubes going basically in through the exact same spot and being on high dose steroids for a number of other conditions which prevented her wound healing. The question we asked them was like five days ago on a prior CT, could we actually have seen this earlier? So playing this one fast just to get down to the spot, you see her prior uh, pigtail and then if you go one beat lower, you see it's still there. So ultimately this was a case of extremely poor luck and tubes basically going exactly through the same site over and over again and taking the path of least resistance, creating a pleurocutaneous fistula. So who do we consult at this point? Great, so Denver Health, we don't count, this is Denver Health. So we don't have CT surgery, you can call TAX and TAX is a couple of surgeons who are uh, do thoracic procedures. And so TAX takes this woman for a CT uh, procedure and they find that she has a two centimeter communication from between the pleural space and the subcutaneous fat from her prior chest tube site. And ultimately we thought that her expiratory air leak was because whenever she took a deep breath in, she entrained air through the fistula. And then when she exhaled and her intrathoracic pressure went up, the tube cleared that air. So basically she was sucking air in from her subcutaneous space and the tube was doing its job and getting rid of it whenever she exhaled. So you can add pleurocutaneous fistula to your differential for expiratory air leak. For those of you that are sadists. All right, so does anyone else know how else um, perhaps an older physician could have recommended treating someone who had this bad subcutaneous emphysema? Is there any other procedure we could theoretically do? Flap, the type of flap. Oh, great. So like a, like a, yeah, great. So like a one-way valve over the, the pleural cavity. Cool. Maybe. I don't know. So there is something called a bl blowhole incision. So this is from 1992. There's something called a blowhole incision in which essentially you cut lines in the person's uh, subcutaneous tissue and you put a wound back on it to suck air out. 
So this was described here by these guys. Um, so they made a three centimeter incision down to the fascia and then hopefully allowed air to be expelled through those uh, holes. So what does that actually look like? Um, we don't really do this because there's not great evidence for it. Um, but essentially, um, you make a hole, you pack some stuff in there, and then you put a wound back on it, and you just suck out the air, which is underlying the tissue. The reason we don't do this very often is because what ultimately happens with air in that space? What does our body do? Yeah, so our body ultimately resorbs that air. And so this lady's follow-up x-ray uh, at one month and then at three months after this pleural uh, connection is closed is normal. And so you can spare them a morbid procedure and a wound vac um, by just giving them time and fixing the underlying issue. Any questions about pleurocutaneous fistulas? Was it painful for her to have all that stuff here? Great question. Yes, it was. So she, um, it was very painful and it was cosmetically awful because like her eyes couldn't really open because all of the air uh, tracks upward um, as air rises. And so it's worse in your upper chest, your face, and your neck. And so, um, yeah, it was painful for her to, to have this. So oh, what was it possible for? Were these a series of like errors or what? Like, I know you said it was like that, but like, I was just expecting to happen. Is that kept the virus or was it just kind of out of hands after the initial? Yeah, good question. So Ben asked, was this an error or something else? And uh, the ultimate thought here was that she was on, so she, I didn't say that, she was on about a gram of steroids a day for her eosinophilic condition and everything else. And so she wasn't healing anything. Um, and they thought it was actually probably just bad luck that she uh, kept having the chest tubes go through the same spot. So you can't actually, unless you're doing a surgical chest tube, you can't actually see the spot it's going in. The pigtails you're sort of just inserting. And they thought that the pigtails were sort of taking the path of least resistance over and over again through the same spot. Um, so the, the one argument that the pulmonary team made at the time was, could she have gotten the VATS earlier? And could we have been like more in tune to the possibility of a pleurocutaneous fistula? but no one had seen one of these ever. And so no one was thinking about it. And uh, even radiology, uh, the official radiology read that said they had a pleurocutaneous fistula uh, took time in like a multidisciplinary meeting and like a couple of thoracic radiologists looking at it to actually confirm. Mm -hmm. So just a, a friendly reminder to like talk to radiology about your scans if you have any questions. To what degree, I'm sure it's not all of it, but like the first time that Don noted the striking outside of the chest cavity, is that enough to start filling someone up yeah, great. And so uh, Luke's question is the initial one right here where the, the hole is outside the thoracic cavity. Yeah, so if your chest tube is improperly located, you will definitely get subcutaneous emphysema. So the thought for x-rays basically like one through three was that the tube was mispositioned and she just kept filling with air from the, the initial mispositioning. It wasn't until about x-ray and tube five that people were like, hey, something else might be going on here. Yeah. Can you go back to the yeah. Uh, if you have a pleurocutaneous fistula, do you, by definition, have a metaphorax there in that space because they can't develop the pressure? Or is there ongoing leakage of air like from like into the pleurocutaneous? Does that make sense? Yeah, good question. So what Cole's asking is if you have a pleurocutaneous fistula, do you automatically have a pneumothorax? I think without lung injury. Is that your question? Yeah. Kind of? Yeah. You, um, yeah, good question. So she. Um, so she was entraining air uh, into the pleural space, which was then compressing her lung. And so, yeah, she automatically had a pneumo because she was, whenever time she had negative pressure in her chest, she was sucking air in from her subq tissue into the, her, her thoracic cavity. And then when she exhaled and she increased her thoracic pressure, that air was then going down its gradient out the chest tube. And so the chest tube was working, but she was just entraining air with each breath. And then the second question was, they actually did a test in the OR to see if she had a, a, a lung injury and she did not, where they submerged her lung under saline and then ventilated it to see if bubbles came up. Um, and they did not find any bubbles. So they presumed that she actually didn't have any parenchymal injury. It was all just a pleurocutaneous fistula. Great question. Any other questions about uh, a very common non-zebra <laughs> illness? Cool. Well, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, three cases of air in the wrong spot. Uh, have a great day.